one of the favorite aspects of this podcast is uh, revealing certain things about our guests that I had no idea about. You know, here on This Might Get Uncomfortable, we uh, we bring people on with, I suppose, a specific idea of general topics we want to cover. But it was pleasantly surprising to uh, have John and Sherry on today and, and suddenly talk about oatmeal and green smoothies. And then I veered the conversation into donuts because that's what I usually do. It's like, oh, we're talking about the healthy stuff. But, you know, like... Life is about balance, right? If you have a green smoothie, I feel like you know having a donut in the same day is not a bad idea. So uh, I, I'm definitely gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna I am gonna go treat myself to a small box of donuts later. And uh, I, I I'm curious if if y'all up in Seattle where you live, if you have any I'll call them dangerous temptations. Do you have Do you guys have a local donut shop? or maybe a pastries or a bakery nearby that's that's and I don't want to use the word guilty pleasure cuz that that's you know sounds like shameful but do y'all do y'all balance out those green smoothies with something a little naughty maybe do you yeah i mean i don't need a pastry shop sherry is a darn good baker so i mean if you're talking apple breads uh our son calls it mommy cookies uh so <clears throat> that's a good that's a great one chip. good old chocolate chip <laughs> cookies i mean she's a hell of a baker so um but yeah that would be that would be my go-to would be like hey why don't you bake something for us today a little sweet treat <laughs> i'm all about the bowl of popcorn well i feel like you know it's it's so funny we talk about baking because i remember maybe like four or five months into into quarantine last year the phrase quarantine baking became this colloquial thing. People I didn't even know had an affinity for baking by virtue of the fact we were all, not all, but many people were stuck in their houses. It became sort of this nurturing, motherly, old school thing. It was like, I've never, I've never in my life seen so many sourdough recipes being passed through email threads and like, oh, but I've got, you know, I've got a raisin sourdough and wait, here's a, here's a rainbow sourdough. And someone had a turmeric sourdough. People were getting really creative and, and truth be told, uh, part of my background is I, I have been, I had been working as a chef for about 15, 16 years and people would sometimes send me, um, like baking competitions. The other day I, I got a, a text from a friend who's like, there's a, tw and, and you know what, actually, Sherry, I'm going to, I'm going to text this or email this to you guys after we're done here, because a f two days ago, a friend sent me a text that was a $20,000 baking competition. Hey, seriously, that's insane. That's fantastic. Send it to me. <laughs> I'm all about it. <laughs> so I'm thinking the mom cookies might need to make an appearance in the baking competition because 20K is nothing to sneeze at, right? And the, the funny thing is though, she sent it to me and I had to text her back. I said, I, I can fake it as a baker. I'm like a faker baker. But my mom, Susan, is actually like the baker in the family. She's the one I go to. Whitney has had my mom's baked goods. My mom actually for years uh, would send me and my friends by virtue of this, Whitney knows, a giant box of baked goods. My mom would spend a week making biscotti, and making uh, like Christmas cookies and little treats. And I, we'd get this giant box of baked goods. So I actually am going to send it to my mom and be like, yeah, mom, go for the 20K. So uh, Sherry, I suggest you, you know, not like you guys don't have enough on your plate. You know, you have a son, you have a dog, you have your business, which we're going to absolutely talk about. But hey, why not? You got nothing to lose, right? 20K is, I don't know, a new addition on that. What would you guys do with 20K? That's what, that, you know what, that's what I want to know. If you won, what would you do with an extra 20K? Oh my. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's tough. Before I answer, though, I have to tell you that while we're on the topic of baking, during quarantine, one of the neighborhood kids down the road, who's in middle school, started this sort of baking competition, where he would baking business rather, but I kind of turned it into a competition because Sherry's baked goods used to be like the thing that went to all the neighbors, you know, like, oh, you just moved in. Congrats <laughs> for moving in. Right. Like beautiful home. Welcome to the neighborhood. We're John and Sherry. Well, Asher is his name down the road. And like I said, he's in middle school. He started dishing out all these flyers. So Sherry's baked goods weren't like a like they weren't like a prized good anymore, you know? <laughs> so that's a just a little kind of neighborhood. <laughs> he makes some really good brownies. <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty good, he's a pretty good baker. But okay, so what would we do with 20,000? 
I'd go on a long trip. I'm craving some mm. travel <laughs> yeah. for a year of being, being in the house. I love the home. I'm a homebody by for sure, but I, I could go for some travel mm. somewhere sunny. I'm a do-gooder. I think, I think I might go, uh, I might go like split half with like, you know, some kind of charity, you know, but, but doing something mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of selfish, shameless travel. But I, I feel like, you know, she took the high road with the travel. I'll take the, you know, do gooder mentality. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll balance it off a little bit. <laughs> Isn't that so interesting? Because I feel like we don't give that much thought to what we would do with extra money. And there's kind of these cliche responses that we have in our head. And I, I think that a lot of them are related to what we thought as kids, perhaps, um, and just like fantasizing about money. And, and then as adults, perhaps we think about more practical things that we would do. And this is something that I've actually been reflecting a lot on myself, because one thing I've been working on is paying down my debt. And I've taken a very aggressive uh, payment plan. So this whole year is centered around that. And as a result, I've been thinking, okay, well, what will happen when my debt's paid down? You know, is it just that I have less money that I'm spending every month? Or am I going to take that money I used to put towards credit cards and the interest and all of that? Will I use that for something else? And then my head started going to, okay, well, maybe I'll put more money towards retirement and I'll put more money in investments. But I also, to your point, John, that I really would love to have more money to give to others. And once I started thinking about that, I started seeing so many opportunities to donate money. And that was fascinating to me. But I recognized that I feel I, I would be happier if I had an like a good amount, basically a lot more money than I thought I would need to donate because once I opened my mind to the possibilities of, of donating more money, I started seeing opportunities come up basically every single day to donate. And then I started to feel a little bit overwhelmed. So one question for myself, and this could be for all of us, is how much money do you want to donate? How often will you do it? And then how do you even decide? Because there's pretty much a charity for anything you can imagine. And then I started to actually research, well, how much are they asking? And it seemed like a lot of these places were recommending a minimum of around $50. And I guess if you have enough money sitting around, maybe $50 a day to some charity is not that much money. But if you haven't set aside money that seems like a lot of money to give away each time for me, at least, right? When I'm focused on on um, paying down my own debt, for example. But then, it, to your point, John, you also think about that balance between how we use our money for ourselves and our lives versus how we use it for other people that might be in need, and that's an ongoing reflection of mine. Is am I putting myself first? Am I putting myself in balance to other people? So I'm kind of curious, John, going back to that, um, if let's say either if you had that extra money or if you currently are doing this, like what, where would you put your money and how much would you like to give and how would you even like figure that in your head? Is it a percentage? Is it something that you've already been working on? Um, cause I think this, this whole conversation around donating money to others or supporting others with our time too because it doesn't necessarily have to be financial. It could be volunteering. Whatever it is in our lives, like how we basically are giving back, is that something that you've given thought to or you're already practicing? Yeah, so you, you bring up a lot of good good points, specifically around <clears throat> time and how we use our time. Um, and, and not to steer the conversation away from personal and more towards business, but one of the things that we adopted was sort of a, a social impact as a, as a company. Um, we wanted to not only say that you get to design and organize your home with us, but that we're going to, we're going to make an impact together, um, in doing so, uh, because, because everybody wants to, to feel like they're contributing and you're right, Whitney, not everybody can contribute $50 a day or, you know, $10,000 a year, right. <clears throat> or more. Um, but if you knew that you were doing something for yourself and for your family, like creating a home, um, and then also getting to give back in some way 
uh, that would be that would be really amazing, right? That would be re- it would be rewarding personally, um, you know, and physically as, in your space. <clears throat> so for us, we created kind of a social impact, and it, it was it's for the business, but it's really rooted in who we are. So the first one is we we donate one uh, percent of our, per, our our profits um, to different charities, right? And then and we can kind of go deeper and talk about kind of. We started with 1%. It's something we've recently adopted in the last year. Um, so hopefully as our business grows and we begin to scale it bigger and better, um, that will too grow. That's the, that's the goal, right? Um, and then we, the second prong of that social impact is really working with awesome vendors. So that's what we call our vendors is like, mm-hmm. we want to work with skilled craftsmen, people who really care about creating the best sofa for your home, or, you know, they care about the durability of, or the sustainability of the products. Right. <clears throat> so when we talk about in, um, when we talk about having some contribution, it's not always just monetarily and it's not always just time. Sometimes it's in our choices and in our decision-making. Um, and that's really, that's really unique for, for us. Right. So we say, you know, that first prong is to donate, a percentage of profit. The second prong is to work with awesome vendors. And the third is to, uh, to donate our own time. And whether that's working locally, you know, with, um, with youth in our community, or that's working with a nonprofit specifically to, to volunteer time, uh, or being a good person, helping neighbors. Um, I think it's all about being intentional because what you appreciate appreciates, right? mm -hmm. Um, and so when you, really take the time to uh, prioritize or, or um, identify the things that matter most to you. Um, in our world, um, it's, it's home. Um, and so we work with a lot of clients who really, they're serious about home, um, but what better way to know that when you're investing in, in your home and doing something for yourself, that there's this, this ripple effect that um, you're, you're working with people who are aligned in your vision and your, your beliefs and, and helping you to achieve um, what it is that, that the end result is, you know, how you want not the home that you've been dreaming up for Lord only knows how long, um, but to know that that investment is going to ripple further down the road. It's going to help other people who are less fortunate or unable to um, be or have the things that you have right now. So it's to us, it's, it's a no brainer, but it's a a win-win approach to creating a home. That's everything you need and nothing more. I love that. And I find it so important to reflect on all these different elements of it, because I think having a home brings up a lot of different emotions for people. And that's something I, I'm really excited to explore today. And I can't wait to hear Jason's response because I think he's he's feeling the same way too. I know Jason especially is focused on buying a home. And uh, one thing I wanted to bring up before we get over to that though, is I did the math and and this surprised me because as we were talking about this idea of giving back financially, I found myself thinking, wow, like, why do I feel like $50 a day is so expensive? <laughs> like, it, it just kind of, in when you think about how easy it is for us to go grocery shopping and spend $50, how easy it is for us to buy something on Amazon or another uh, website, like people spend probably $50 quickly on, in some ways, but when it comes to donating, maybe it's like, wow, that's a lot. And then I did the math. 50 times 365 days is over $18,000 a year. So actually it kind of goes back to Jason's question of if you had $20,000, what would you do with it? In a way that that's your answer, right? $50 a day. If you picked like one charity every single day for the entire year to give that money to could make a really substantial impact whether it's an individual, it could be like a GoFundMe, it could be an, a nonprofit. I mean, there's so many places where, where you could put that money. But if that money is coming out of your personal pocket, to me, $18,000 a year seems like a lot of money to spend when I add it up. So it's interesting, too, to reflect on our, our concepts around money. And, and like, even if you were to donate to just one charity, can you imagine giving eighteen? dollars thousand dollars a year it might feel like a lot but if it then you could also break it down 
and think, well, I guess I could probably take that percentage of what I'm making, or maybe I could spend a little less at the grocery store and put some of that money. Maybe I don't go to the coffee shop as frequently. And, and I always just find it so fascinating. And this definitely ties into the conversation around home ownership because that can involve a lot of money too. And this is where Jason, I think, comes in because it feels like you, Jason, are you're, you're reflecting on the financial side of home, home ownership quite frequently. Well, I, I definitely. And, and before I get into the financial side of it, I really think that the, the associations we have with home are something that is e- extremely important. And, and I, I talk about this because I was having a conversation with my, my mom, Susan, who lives in Detroit. Most of my family's back in Detroit. And, um, you know, the, the, the cost of living for real estate in Detroit, Michigan is substantively lower than the West Coast, you know, Seattle or LA. I mean, it's, you know, for, for, the, for the cost of the average house here, um, which I, for the first time ever, the, the median house price in Los Angeles County crested over 725000 and in Orange County, it's over 800000 so, you know, back in Detroit for 800 grand, you, you get a literal mansion, you know, you get like a, oh my God, you must be, you know, a, a, a drug kingpin or an entrepreneur in the tech world or, you know, famous rapper or something. I mean, you know, 800 K in Detroit, you are living large 800, 800 K here. It's like, oh, that's a nice two bedroom fixer upper. Okay. That being said, I was talking to my mom, Susan yesterday, uh, actually about a video you sent me, Whitney, of a woman who had converted uh, as sort of the digital nomad movement becomes like a big thing. We see it on social media, people converting these sprinter vans or Ford now has these really cool transit vans that people are putting beds, they're putting kitchen sinks, they're putting you know portable toilets. This woman had two of her cats and had like a cool built-in litter box, had her living area. Everything was kind of convertible where it, it was just a very efficient, well-designed space. And I thought, you know what? That'd be a lot cheaper than buying a house. I could get a discount from my buddy who works for Ford. I could get the conversion. Great. But then going back to the emotional side of the associations we have with home, I don't want to be cliche here, but I'm I'm very much a Cancerian in the astrological world, like home, nesting, being in my shell, having safety. So I was talking to my mom. I'm like, you know, I could probably get a van like that, but exclusively living in a van for you know, God knows how long with my animals, I thought at some point I know myself and my heart will yearn for a house. So it's interesting to me, you know, when we talk about the emotional associations, the reason I want to buy a house is because the house I'm renting now, you know, there are limitations. I can't jackhammer the concrete in the back. I can't do what I want with the garden. I can't necessarily plant all the fruit trees I would want. So part of my desire to buy a home is the emotional connection in my heart to having my space, making it my own, but also investing long term in you know the environment that I'm living in. So with all that with all that being said, I I'm curious with the work that you both do and your clients, what kind of emotional responses or or associations do you detect from people? You know, why is it important for them to create this home in their vision. You know, what, what, what's the deeper, I guess, more spiritual, emotional side of the work that you do? And what kind of things do you hear from people? Yeah, no, you bring up a, a really, really great um, caveat of, of the home industry um, and the world of, of home that um, really launched John and I to, to diving in even different, different and really thinking differently about the way we approach. Um, how do you create a home? And it, it led us right back to our, our, our North Star, the, 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 the on center, our beacon is um, purpose. Um, coming from a place and, and understanding what your um, what, what's your purpose? Why do things matter to you? Um, for, for me, 
I view like I view home as a place that's supposed to nourish you, that's supposed to fill you up. I mean, we're being pulled in a million different directions um, all day, every day, being overstimulated. But when we come home, um, you, we want our, our our space to be a place that we can decompress, uh, a space that's intuitive and anticipates our needs. Um, but that's completely different than how other people um, may interpret their needs of what they need from their home, and that's really. The, the beauty and the magic of, of what we do is getting to um, a point where we are able to assess, take the time to assess the needs and, and what matters and what do you value? Because that's the core, that's the foundation that we're going to make all of the other future decisions about your home, whether it's uh, window coverings or our area rug, or it's an organizing container, all of it needs to be rooted in purpose. That's true to you. Mm. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, you, Jason, were just like all over the vibe of what really makes elegant simplicity, yeah. right? When we step foot in a space um, to remodel somebody's home, to furnish in style, to organize, or if we're looking at it on a, on a, on a table, a blueprint, we start our process with the emotionality of home. Mm -hmm. It is like... Yeah. True to the core, elegant simplicity is about the emotionality of how you view home and what home really means to you on an emotional level. Sherry talked about for, for us, it's nurturing. It's, um, you know, it's this family space, this, this space that you connect in, right? That you have lasting, meaningful connection. But for somebody else, home, like yourself, Jason, might be a refuge, might be like might be the place that you go that's like this is my home this is where i can not only feel reprieve but i can truly connect with myself right yeah and, <clears throat> and it's um i always say that our mirror uh, or sorry our home is a, a mirror reflection of self Right. <clears throat> I remember um, as, as a child sitting in the back seat of my parents' car, driving at nighttime from wherever we were uh, to back home. And uh, I couldn't help but I'd be mesmerized as I was driving through the neighborhoods and see all the lights on in their windows. And uh, it just, to me, it, it spoke. I'm, I was always curious what's happening inside it? What's, what's going on in there? What stories are, are there um, un unfolding? And uh, it was Oprah, Winf in Oprah Winfrey who said that everyone has a story to mm. be told. They just need a platform to tell it. Mm. And that's how, oh. how John and I, we view home, that, that we have this opportunity when we create a home to tell the narrative uh, and curate all of our, our materials, all of our, our belongings in a way that tells the narrative and the story that we want the world, that we want our family, everyone that we welcome into our home, how do we want them to see our story? What story do we want to tell them? You know, and that that's a, a really fun, fun journey. What's interesting to me too is, is how, when I go to other people's houses for the first time, share, it's so interesting you're talking about this because uh, I was laughing inside when you were describing, I'm like, that's, that's very voyeuristic, Sherry. As a child, you were just like, I wonder what's happening in that house. I want to, but I feel that way too. There are times, especially when I've lived in, um, when I lived in New York, when I lived in Chicago, you know, I, I would be in my building per se, and I'd be looking across at a building on the other side of the avenue or the street, and you see these little snippets of people's lives, and, and then the theater of the mind comes in. It's like, I wonder what they do. Or, you you know, you get glimpses of people fighting or kissing or, you know, making love or whatever. You know, it's like, oh, I shouldn't be watching. Okay. Oh, but I can't stop. Um, my point is that when I go into people's homes, it is always interesting to see this reflection of 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 who they are. And uh, a former uh, a former guest, a previous guest of mine and Whitney's, her name is Kate Faust. She posted something about home design the other day, which I thought was very interesting. And she was talking about how the aesthetic of minimalism uh, and modernism has been something that she's been reacting against. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'm going to keep swiping. And I'm a huge fan of Dwell Magazine. Uh, I you know, read Monarch Architecture. There is a certain, and I'll talk about this in a minute, trying to, to speak in words sort of as a pseudo client of yours. I, I'm, I'm getting closer to like 
I'm getting closer to describing what it is my aesthetic is. My point is when Kate posted this thing, she was showing all these slides of like, this is what people think is contemporary and modern. And and every time I see housing magazines, this is all I see. Same thing over and over. And she said, you know what I'm claiming? I'm a maximalist. I was like, oh, that's interesting. What does this mean? And she showed images of houses in like Marrakesh and Morocco and all of these, what we in the Western world would call, you know, tchotchkes and ornamentation and very ornate and um, a lot going on in terms of accoutrement and design. And she's like, you know what? The hell with minimalism. She's like, I want all my stuff. I want it packed to the gills, wall to wall. And I thought it's so interesting because I'm curious how you both feel in terms of, you know, trends and things that you see people wanting and whether or not as clients, that's actually what they want, or if it's just what they've been conditioned to want because they've seen it over and over again, and that's the hip thing right now. So I bring this up because she was so contradictory and being like, I'm a maximalist. I want all my stuff, and I want my, like, you know, den and all that. You know, it was really kind of cool, and I had never heard anyone phrase it like, I want to be a maximalist in my home. I don't want to be a minimalist. So what do you see? And how do you help people get to the heart of what is actually true to them instead of just, I don't know, paying attention to trends and what's just cool in the moment? Yeah, we <clears throat> we actually don't want to see your Pinterest or your Instagram collection. We're not, certainly we won't dis be disrespectful, but that's really not what we're after. Because as you're, uh, as you're going after, Jason, that is conditioned. You're conditioned to like what you see. So you, so you only open your mind to what you have seen, right? And this gal that you're speaking of, like, kudos to her. Like, if she's like, I am a maximalist, go for it. Like, that's your jam. That, that's, what, that's what she needs, right? And that's, that's what we talk about. You know, our belief is home is everything you need and nothing more. So if she needs everything, that's fantastic. Like, so, that's great. So if she were, let's say, our <clears throat> client, we would dig deeper and say, why? Mm -hmm. Why are you? Let, let, let's let's peel back the layers and let's start to um, dig into understanding why you feel compelled, why those things um, you gravitate towards them. Um, because as you start to dig deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, you you start to uncover more about yourself that sometimes and a lot of times we don't even know is there because we we build <clears throat> up as we grow and, and we go through life, we build up this shell, this protection layer around us where again, we're being conditioned by the, our environments, what we see, what we do, who we surround ourselves with, um, that we don't know what we don't know, right? Until somebody steps in and helps open your eyes to peel back the, 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 the veil, per se, to expose you to a new way of thinking, a new way of thinking or seeing life. Um, and so, so we always challenge our clients to, when we, we go through the, the initial assessment phase, don't don't come to us with pictures of things that you want us to recreate. Certainly, we're going to create these beautiful, you know, drop dead, gorgeous spaces for you. But in order for it to be a true reflection of you, we need to spend some time digging into you and what really ticks ticks you or makes you, makes tick. you tick or <laughs> or what mo really motivates you. Um, and that that's where um, I, I think a lot of the the home industry, we jump straight into the fun part of the the organizing reveal and the HGTV reveal of picking out the paint colors and the, the color swatches. And that's all fun, but there's a time and place. And just like anything else in life, if we want to achieve a goal, whether it's to get fit, whether it's to eat healthy, whether it's to uh, travel to every single state in the United States um, before you die, uh, you need to set a goal. And in order to achieve that goal, you need to um, understand why that, what's driving you to achieve, to, to try to achieve that. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I love that because I, I'm a big why person. So anytime I'm asked why, I get very excited. <laughs> I And I love other people that ask why. I'm fascinated at the responses. And I love this approach because it does feel not only personalized, but it, it feels deep versus almost a superficial idea. Like a lot of us, to your point, gather all these surface level concepts of what we want. We're very preoccupied at looking what other people are doing and how they live without 
often thinking about like, is this really what suits me? Is this really what I want? Or am I just trying to fit in? And I think this is especially important or has been at least during the past year when so many people are spending time in their homes. And I think it, it's probably been an amazing time for you with people thinking about like, how do they want to live? What makes them feel comfortable? What makes them feel safe and secure? And how do, can they thrive in that environment? And now with so many people starting to work from home, uh, like never before. I mean, they are kind of forced to, but during pa- the pandemic, but now a lot of people are saying, Hey, I want to continue working from home. So my space is incredibly important. And I think we've seen the rise of home plants, for example. And it, it, it looked from the trends, like people were investing a lot more money and time into caring for their home, which I imagine has, has been really good for your business. And I also wanted to go back to this point of being a voyeur. Um, One thing that was a big part of my life and I've noticed through TikTok has been a big part of other people's lives and I guess still is, is the game The Sims. And I remember growing up and really loving creating virtual homes. And as I was saying before, like when we were thinking about money and like, what am I going to spend all this extra money on? As children, you fantasize. I remember fantasizing about what my home was going to be like. For me, one of the most important things that I've wanted is a guest room. Like I've just fantasized about having a place where I can invite other people into my home. We didn't have that growing up. And so I think sometimes as children, it's like what you don't have is what you desire. And uh, so every time people come to visit, it was like, well, where are we going to put them? Where are they going to sleep? You know, and I have always loved going to people's homes and having my own room. You know, Jason and I have (laughs) this one story in particular that just makes me laugh so much, Jason, of all the traveling that we've done. And there's this one time we were invited into someone's home who was so courteous and saved us a ton of money is in in, uh, New York. And we you know, we could have (laughs) Jason's laughing because he knows I'm talking about we could have like spent a ton of money at a hotel or an Airbnb. Uh, and fortunately this, this acquaintance said, Hey, come on into our home. When we got there, it was like, uh Oh, we're not in the most comfortable situation. <laughs> you know. And I think most people have been there. Like, you know, you end up being put in the couch another time I can think of. And again, like you're grateful for these experiences, but it's uncomfortable when you're staying at someone's home. And that's part of this conversation too, is not just the time that we spend, but anyone who comes into our home, especially as things start to open up again and maybe people start traveling, they start visiting each other. This is a big consideration. And I don't want to be someone that just throws somebody on the couch and is like, hey, you're not going to sleep very well, but at least you have a place to sleep or putting them on, them on an uncomfortable pullout couch or an uh, inflatable air mattress that doesn't stay inflated all night. Most of us have had those kind of horrific stories. And one last thing, it reminds me another uh, kind of meme that's gone around TikTok. (laughs) That if you haven't seen it, it's probably not that funny as I describe it, but it's really funny visually of people that show. I've sent you a few of these, Jason, so I'll see if I can pull them up for the show notes um, and to send to Sherry and John. If you're not on TikTok, you probably missed this, but... It is like the the cliche things that people have to do when they spend the night at someone else's house and how it's such a cliche experience to not be comfortable and people end up sleeping on the floor with like the rug wrapped around them or the the blinds wrapped around them because they don't even have enough blankets and they don't have a pillow and you're kind of like huddled up in the fetal position. You know, like I think I had enough of those experiences that I'm like, this is my mission that every guest that stays with me is going to have their own room and their own bathroom and they're going to have a comfortable place to sleep and privacy. Like that's like my dream home. So I guess that answers the question of, I probably don't want to live in a van because there wouldn't be that extra space for them unless there is some like special, special thing that you can do. Lastly, one more thing on that note. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is getting me my brain going all these directions. Jason, I didn't didn't tell you this, I don't think. But um Sherry and John, I've I've I do really love to travel on the road. And um I actually 
sleep out in my car in my sedan and travel around um, from time to time. And last year I did that with a friend and she camped in a tent and it went okay. Like, you know, it was like our own separate rooms in a hotel or something, but we were camping. And then I discovered there's this whole new um, trend of people sleeping on top of their cars and they have these tents. I think they're called birds, birds nests. So I, I kind of take back that idea. If you had a van, you could technically get one of those bird nest style camp uh, tents and put them on top and there's your guest room. So, you know, I guess where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> but uh, so much to hear your input on, on Sherry and John. So I'm curious, um, first of all, like how has the pandemic shifted things, if any, or has it emphasized things in people's lives that you're able to step in in a, in a stronger way than before because people are more aware of it? Yeah. So first, I just want to make sure we don't like miss it because it was kind of like a couple conversations ago, but <clears throat> Jason asked about trends and we would probably just tell you the hell with trends, right? Home is what it means to you. And, and Whitney, to your point, like there's a, there's a core part of you that views home as an opportunity to host people, to, to have people gather with you, right? Um, and so just easily in, inside of our conversation today, we've already started to discover like what makes Jason vibe about home versus what makes you, right? And, and there's even, um, you know, and somewhat nomadic as you are, Whitney, you still have a part of you that's really, really rooted um, and entrenched in what you view as home, what home means to you. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of let Sherry, you know, answer your question, but. Um, yeah. Um, and so your question was around um, the pandemic and how it's really uh, changed, uh, changed perspective. And um, I'm, I'm really excited that, that we're going here because I think that um, certainly the, the home industry is just on fire right now because we're, people are spending so much time in their homes, um, more so than than we would like to admit, um, you know, pre-pandemic. But um, we're spending time looking around uh, at stuff that we um, otherwise wouldn't have noticed, a crack in the wall, a uh, paint that's chipping, fraying fabric on the edge of the sofa or a rug that feels a little warm. Like there's so many things that you don't even realize um, because pre-pandemic we were go, 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 go. And we were distracted by so many other things. Um, in our world, what we've seen shift um, is uh, I, I think our willingness to reprioritize the mm. things that are important <clears throat> to us. Yeah. Um, as the as John and I reflect and kind of look, uh, kind of the thirty thousand foot view onto the the home industry and um, home, uh, the industry is broken. Both the organizing and the design industry, it's literally fraying around the edges. And I know. Um, from magazines that we talked about, um, finding inspiration in magazines to HGTV or Netflix. Now we've got all sorts of organizing trends. and and uh, design shows. Um, it, it's literally uh, it's all about layering on the pretty, and it skips over the intentionality. It's all about the big reveal. And so um, for for John and I, we've spent the last year saying, no, how can we do things differently? Because <clears throat> this isn't right. It, 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 it's certainly it, it's not wrong. It, it works for some people, but for us, it doesn't resonate in a way that's true to who we are and how we define home. Um, and so we spent the the, the last year, as I, I'd mentioned previously, retooling the way that we work with with clients and helping them really get get raw and, and true to themselves mm -hmm. about you, Whitney, have one version of what home is. Jason, you have another version. Now, how do you blend those things and blended families? If there's mm -hmm. more people in the mix, <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's not easy. So you mm -hmm. can spend, waste a lot of time, money, right. and energy going out and buying a showroom full of, of beautiful furniture. Um, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't meet or or live up to the everyday the way everyday life unfolds, it's just wasted money and time. And it's just a matter of time. It's a ticking time bomb before you're unhappy, you're dissatisfied, you're wanting something new. And it's this crazy cycle that um, creates overwhelm and anxiety and puts us in a state where we can't be present. <clears throat> yeah. um, so John and I, we work with our clients um, for a minimum of 12 months. 
Um, and so that is completely unlike anything else in the industry. And I know it's not something that a lot of people like to hear because we are in this society of instant gratification, mm -hmm. everything. We want it now, we want it done, we want it perfect, and we want it our way. So because we've, we've shifted the way that we work with clients, organizing is the foundation to creating any home. You have to understand the purpose. You have to understand the why. You have to understand your value. And once you have that fu uh, functional foundation established no. and you understand your purpose and why things matter, then you can start to kind of dig into um, your style preferences and the way things look because you're able to layer them into your home and, and, and kind of create furniture layouts and choose uh, between fabrics. you know fabrics and different options and something, the choices that resonate with you, not just option A, B, and C because they kind of look pretty, mm -hmm. um, but they, you know, <clears throat> does that make sense? Are you guys tracking with what, what I'm saying? Okay, because I can get really introspective when it comes <laughs> to home. <laughs> We love that. I think I think this is actually fascinating and really important because the aim of our show is to go deep and talk about things that aren't superficial, you know? And I I'm really reflecting a lot on this because unlike Jason, I don't spend as much time thinking about like a future home. Um I feel fine with the way things have been, you know, similar to, to you, Sherry, like travel is important to me. And I think about it in, in, as to your point in different ways, but just hearing you talk, it's, it's fascinating and getting me to reflect on really what it means to have a home and thinking about, okay, well, all these different future scenarios and going back to the very beginning of our conversation, I think another important element of this for me as a planner is, ooh, maybe I should set aside some more money so that I can have more financial flexibility to do some of these things. Because I think that's a big barrier and something important to touch upon today. When you're talking about spending 12 months with people, the first thing that comes up for me is, well, is that financially uh, feasible for most people? And and of course, you're not always going to want to reach most people. But in terms of the finances, I wonder if that's a barrier of people thinking, oh, I really want to do this, but I don't want to spend that much money. And so I'm not going to do it. Or perhaps somebody says, oh, I really want to do that. I don't have the money now. I'm going to save up and then I'll have the money to do this. And so money is a big element when it comes to the home. And I'm curious if you can touch upon that and how that plays out with your clients or potential clients or pe do people not do things because of money and how do you address that when money comes up as a as an obstacle for others? Yeah, no, that's that's again another great question. Um, John and I, we are educators at our soul. We're, we're teachers. Mm -hmm. We we love to uh, help people um, make educated decisions, and so we really um, we we've, we've dug into. Um, educating people through our blog and through social media, through podcasts, because there are a lot of people who aren't in a position where they can afford to work with us. But that doesn't mean um, that they don't deserve to have a home that reflects them and <clears throat> have all of these wonderful things that that um, makes up a home. Um, and so certainly money is a barrier. Um, but I, I think that when we we talk with people through all these different outlets and help them um, realize that the fun part isn't where you're supposed to begin. That's actually the middle. When we open their eyes and help them start to, to reflect on the things that they need, the things that they matter, um, you know, when you realize that, that for us, home is a place that nourishes us. So we found, we, we turned to an organization called The Hunger Project when we wanted to start contributing something as small as $5 a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not, in our opinion, in, in the way that we live, it's not going to change life dramatically for us. Um, but we realized that, that home is where we nourish our souls. Mm -hmm. And so the way for us to give back is to um, just as small as it is, it's going to make a huge impact uh, down kind of that ripple effect that we were talking about. Wow. Yeah. So I think, and then I also think that, you know, as you mentioned, like there, there is this natural barrier to 
what do things cost around home? Mm -hmm. Which is why we launched a free resource library where we kind of break it down. We've been doing this since 2009. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of experience of what it really looks like to furnish and style a space, like a living room, like truly to create that um, with with the things that you value. You know, let's say, let's say, Jason, let's say you value uh, sustainability and durability, right? So, you know, you want to you want the the things that you bring into your home to to uh, have a have, have a great impact on the environment. Um, but you also want them to live up to say your life. Maybe Jason, you're just hard on your stuff. Like there's no doubt about it. Like, okay, cool. Well, there's a process to that. Right. And we've done enough work in educating and giving that freely to say like, this is what you can anticipate a living room costing. If you're working with an interior designer to find those pieces, certainly can you find ways to make it less and do it on your own. Absolutely. Which is why we're so committed to educating, right? We're committed to educating, not just about our process, not just about, you know, uh, our values, not just about, you know, the things that make us tick or the trends of the year (laughs) and the color of the, like, we're not, that's not, that's not all right. We're interested in, in educating about truly the cost and being as transparent as possible about that, I think that really helps Whitney in kind of, you know, eliminating those barriers because then people can say, ah, you know what? I'm not ready yet, but in two years, I'm going to be ready. Right. Or I'm, I'm ready. I want to do this. Right. What's it cost to work with you and how does that happen? And, and ultimately I think that Sherry kind of hit the, the nail on the head a little bit earlier in what she was talking about. She said, we work with our clients for a, a 12 month basis minimum. Right. There's a, we have a a design and organizing membership. And the reason we have a membership is because we believe that home is continuous. There's no beginning to home and there's really no end to home. You're just creating, right? You're just living, you're existing and life changes. I mean, Jason's looking to move to the Pacific Northwest. Life is going to be drastically different for him in that space. And, and, and I don't want to derail the conversation too much, but I, I love this story. It happened last year. We, we planted our first vegetable garden <laughs> and we have a two-year-old. Well, he's three now, but he was two then. Okay. So he's just starting to really put together some sentences and you know, he's doing a really good job, but we, we've planted, you know, we planted all our spinach, our romaine, all of our, you know, organic produce is going to be growing and we're super excited. Hook up irrigation. We're feeling like, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of weeks, every day we would have gone out to see if the broccoli had started to, to sprout, right? Did it, does it, can you see a little baby broccoli in there? Can, can, is it time to cut the spinach? Is it time to cut the lettuce, right? The point in saying this is that at the probably midway through the growing season, our son, Brooklyn, were outside and he grabs the head of broccoli and yanks it out. And Sherry and I are like, what are you, what are you doing? doing? <laughs> And we had to explain to him, he thought that if he pulled on it, it would come faster. He thought it would, he thought it would grow faster. So the, the point of the story is that, that home is a lot like growing a vegetable garden, right? It takes time and that timeline is going to be different for everybody. But we know in our experience that in whether we're designing or organizing your home, Home is continuous. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to change. As we're working together, it's going to continue to evolve. And and that shouldn't be home, a home that's continuous and that philosophy and that, that, that sort of method shouldn't be a detractor. It should be something you embrace because you go, wow, now the decisions that I'm making, I'm not chasing a trend on Instagram. I'm not chasing maximal maximalism or minimalism. I'm me. I'm creating a home for myself. So I'll kind of be quiet now, but <laughs> but it's really important part of our process is to, to, to allow time to get to know one another in the same fashion that you guys do with your podcast. So I think the cool part of this philosophy of you framing this as, as a, as a journey with no end, it's just a continuing evolution of one's relationship to their home space. I, I love it because it, It goes against the grain of what I think has been sort of the prevailing theme of especially the last 14 months. It's interesting, right? Because on one hand, you're seeing people reframe their relationship 
and asking better, higher quality questions about how do I want to live? What, you know, the why, what does this represent? Why bring a new piece in? But the, the counter to that is, you know, I, I'm reading a ton of real estate articles all the time and what, you know, what the market's doing and how many people in the mad housing rush since the start of the pandemic um, have been in these bidding wars foregoing inspections, foregoing touring the house, buying it sight unseen. And how many people move into these houses they bought on spec with no inspection, not actually physically even visiting the home. And then finding out, A, they don't even like the vibe or the aesthetic of the house, or that the foundation's cracked, or the entire plumbing is shot, or it needs all new electrical, and then they're faced with a you know $150,000 remodel bill. And I love what you're saying because it's 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 not sort of this desperate urge to like, oh, we got to find a house. We got to move out of the city. We got to go. We don't care. No, no, no. We got to outbid everyone. We offer them a hundred grand more. We don't even need to see it. And that's becoming more and more common. But what you're saying is, let's be methodical. Let's engage in self-inquiry. Let's get a deeper level of self-awareness about what this means to us instead of just, we need to buy something. We don't care. We don't care. Let's just buy something. And I got caught up in that energy a little bit last year. I was like, well, I've got this nest egg. I, I, I just, okay, looking, you know, looking at Portland, looking at Bellingham. Oh, I could just, well, I could just buy this right now. And I was like, dude, you're not going to go buy a house you haven't been in. That's, for me, crazy. For me, I was like, don't do, don't do not do this. So I love that your approach is antithetical to that sort of desperate urge to get something without even realizing it's appropriate for you or not. But the, the, the other question in this too, or Whitney, do you have something you want to jump in on? Well, it ties into also the big trend that we saw here in Southern California of people moving out of California and to places like Austin. And it just became a cliche. I mean, Jason, you were kind of obsessed with, <laughs> with this trend of people moving to Austin, people to moving to Portland, people moving wherever else. And I was really fascinated with that too. I mean, Jason, you're you're talking about moving as well, so maybe that's why it was something you were paying extra attention to. And it, it does tie back around to money because people thought, wow, like I can't really buy much in Southern California. I'll move somewhere else. But a big question there is, do you even want to live there? You know, going back to this whole money conversation is you might be able to save money by moving elsewhere. But if you want to be in Southern California, then why why are you moving somewhere that you don't really want to be just because it's more financially affordable? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I wonder how many people move elsewhere and get the dream house, save all this money. And then once it's all done, they sit there and think, do I even really want to live here now that it's all said and done? Like, is this home making me happy enough to justify living somewhere that I don't even really enjoy when I step outside of my home. And I think there was this mad dash too. I, I know for friends that did move to Austin, they noticed like the energy was so intense there and the whole city was changing. So by the time you settle in in Austin, Austin's not even what it was a year or so ago because the community is basically just like Southern California. So if you're trying to get away from from the LA vibe or whatever, it's basically there now in Austin, Texas, for, as far as I'm aware, because of how many people moved there. But then to your point, Jason, people were so desperate to move there that the prices went up. So now suddenly moving to Austin is not quite as affordable. Granted, there's all sorts of tax benefits and whatever else involved. It's a complicated subject matter. But I was fascinated in watching that because Sure, it's appealing to hear how little people pay for home ownership or even rent, you know. LA right now is expensive, but I actually really love living in LA, so it's been worth it to me. And if you stay put long enough, you can actually, I mean, my apartment is just like insanely affordable because I've been living there for so long that you know, you couldn't get that now if I tried to look for a new place to live. So there is something to be said about staying put sometimes is part of my point. Staying put either because some things change in, in where you're living and staying put in the sense that maybe you're there because you really love it and it's worth any of the pros, you know, the cons might even outweigh the pros or it balances out. So I imagine that you, John and Sherry, pr probably help people through the 
some of this process of weighing out pros and cons. Maybe I don't know if it's as much about your location, but the whole experience. Um, is that something that you help people with is determining where they're going to live? Yeah, we've actually, we have a handful of clients, as John mentioned earlier, um, we've got a handful of clients that actually bring us in while they're looking for homes. They will not buy a home until that we've, we've gotten our eyeballs on the, on the property because we've spent so much time and we're speaking the same language that they want to make, they know that, that home is rooted beyond the four walls, um, that you need to look past the stuff that's in the home. And a lot of times, most people, they jump right into to piling in the pretty that, that we discussed earlier, that they'll bring us in after, and then they'll have buyer's remorse, which is um, we're, what we're talking about, people who will rush and, and flood to relocating to different cities and different towns. And it's almost like, um, I, I kind of chuckled because it reminds me of like the the modern day keeping up with the Joneses. Um, and, and it also like um, the, the whole toilet paper, you know, the rush of trying to get toilet paper and the shortage of toilet paper during the pandemic. Um, it, it's, we feel this need for change, but as humans, we resist diversity uh, and, and change in our lives a lot of time. And so when um, we panic, we, we try to change our situation. And um, when it comes to home, clients, they, they, they bring us in on, as early as possible. It allows us to begin uh, even greater transformation and growth um, because we're laying uh, the, the seeds or the foundation mm-hmm. that, that is going to grow a full mm-hmm. garden. Yeah. And I mean, even to that point, sometimes it's not just a remodel. Sometimes it's a new build. And then a client brings us in in the architectural phase. And so now we're working hand in hand with the architect and the custom home builder, but really we're serving the client. We're helping them organize their existing space where they're currently living, and we're helping them design their new space. And that's obviously going to take longer than 12 months. Um, so you want that relationship to be strong. You want that relationship to be intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, you want that foundation together to really have meaning in that home that you're creating to have purpose and intentionality. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not abnormal. We've had clients bring us in and say, what do you think of this space? I haven't put an offer yet. Now, this is obviously pre-bidding war. We're talking 2015, 2016. But Jason, to your point, we're seeing a ton of the same stuff up here where people are buying homes sight unseen while they're out of the country, uh, waiving inspection. And it, it is really scary um, for some people. And for others, they are budgeting that risk. They are, are they are completely conscientious of the risks that they're taking, and they're not just doing it to um, get in a home. For some people, they're doing it because that's the home. That's the one they want. That's the space they want to change, be it the location because it's close to family, be it the location because it's a view, be it the location because it's, it's centrally located to where they potentially will return to work. Or maybe they'll work part-time from work, right? They'll go half and half, some days at the office, some days at home. And so we're our perspective on home and the way in which we're working with clients is really taken off um, throughout the pandemic, right? And yeah, there certainly are still those, those clients out there who are looking for the quick fix. And that's really, that's okay because that's not, they're not for us and and we're we're comfortable. Um, in saying that and we're comfortable in being different, but we're really comfortable in saying that not because we don't want to serve them, but because we can't serve them because what they want is something different than what we are. And that's, that's really good clarity, right? That's immense clarity. If you had, we call it a clarity call, but let's say like you had an intake call with Sherry, right? And you came away from that call and you're like, absolutely freaking not. Like I, I am not down with what they're talking about. That would be okay because what did you come away with? You came away with, I'm not down with that. I need this. And that's why we call it a clarity call because the goal of the call is to give you clarity. And our entire process is really, you know, our framework around home is really built to understand your why and to give you clarity on what home means to you. Well, let's let's talk about clarity because I think that's a great jump off point. And, and the question I have is around communication and how how clients and people that want to work with you 
different ways that they try and convey what's in their mind's eye or in their heart in a way that you understand. Because I think, I think you know, human communication in general is tricky, right? B- because I believe that that language, language is our best attempt as humans to describe the reality we perceive. But so often, because the words that are coming out of my mouth can be misinterpreted based on the movie in your head of how you're interpreting the words that I'm saying. So, you know, as kind of like maybe a role play for a second, right? Um, I feel like when I, when I, when I kind of dream of like the home that I want, it's this, it's this mishmash of like, I love old, beautiful, well-kept craftsman houses, but I really love traditional Japanese style tatami houses that have the sliding doors and the sunken living space and the low tables. But then I also really like, you know, modernism and clean design and very Teutonic and for lack of a better word, maybe a little bit, you know, German, not cold. So there's like, okay, you love old craftsmen, you love traditional Japanese, you love modernism. Where the hell is the intersection of those things? No idea, right? But see, as a potential client, I'm, you know, I sit down with you guys, I'm trying to discover that. Is it just through words that you try and envision? Or do you say, um, I don't have really good art skills uh, with written art, but but would it be, you know, okay, Jason, we want you to sketch out maybe what your vision is. How do you, how, my, my question is, how do you try and accurately, as accurately as possible, surmise and interpret through words, visuals, drawings, whatever it may be, what do you encourage your clients or potential clients to do to accurately convey to you in a way that you understand or closely understand what they actually want? What's that like? Because I feel so much can get lost in translation. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, uh, that's awesome because, you know, you're describing all of these different things that you are really um, in tune with that you really like. And we've talked a lot about the why we would ask you why, why that's what we would start with. Why do you like, why do you like the sunken living room? Why do you like low tables? And we have um, the, the first phase of our, our design and organizing process is what we call a home strategy day. And we actually break it into two different days because they're completely immersive and comprehensive. Where the first day we really dig into like the foundation, the, the organizational piece of it. But once we traverse over into design, we understand how your, your life unfolds, your routines, all that stuff. We dig into the design home strategy day. And that's when um, really a lot like this, it starts with conversation Mm -hmm. um, where we have to let our guards down. We have to be comfortable um, and knowing that in the end, we're all pushing to achieve and accomplish the same end goal. But in order for us to get from where we are today to where it is that you want to be, um, we need to start kind of dissecting. So Jason, you'd mentioned you've got like three different styles that that you're, you're hip on and you really like. And so then it's starting conversation around each of those, the craftsman home, the craftsmanship, like you started to talk about um, the, oh. the attributes and the quality and the structure, like, what does it remind you of? What, like, let's dig into your childhood and what are some of your favorite childhood memories? Like, totally not everything about your childhood do we need to know. <laughs> no, but it's kind of thinking about what are the happy things around your childhood that you remember when it relates to home or um, why, why did you, uh, why are you looking in certain areas? Is it just the, the, architecture of the homes? Is it the uh, the surrounding areas? Are you an outdoor guy? Do you love to be at one with nature and go out and explore? Um, and, and so it really, the, the discovery of uh, where design intersects with our true uh, passions or our true wants and our, our visions that are up here, because most people honestly can't articulate what it is that they, they see up here. That's why we default to pictures on Pinterest and Instagram and TikTok, because as humans, Mm -hmm. we we default to the path of least resistance. And so it's about having true, meaningful conversation and um, understanding why we gravitate towards these things through curiosity. Okay. So I have an uncomfortable question because this this might get uncomfortable and it may or may not. Uh, I have a couple of of friends in my life that one, uh, he and his husband are... um, landscape architects here in Los Angeles. And the other is a home builder for a lot of celebrities in town. And 
through these friends, I hear a lot of really interesting stories, stories about incredible kinship and connection and stories about, I'll be generous and say, difficult clients. And some of the stories, the horror stories I have heard are really interesting because, um, you know, at, at, as an example, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a direct example, and then I want to hear some st- either stories or perspectives. You can be as general or specific as you want. A, f- a dear friend of mine who has the landscaping business um, is doing a job in the Pacific Palisades, kind of uh, between Malibu and Santa Monica here in, in LA. Really wealthy part of town. And they uh, brought in 25 uh, ficus trees, about eight and a half feet. They wanted a a, a sort of a... A, pr- a privacy fence, but you know, made out of trees. So they bring the trees, and the clients like the trees aren't tall enough. They said, "What do you mean the trees aren't tall enough?" This they said they're eight and a half feet. They said we asked for nine foot. They said you you know that ficus trees grow, and if the issue is that they're eight and a half feet and they're not nine, they're they're going to get to they no take them back. So. The land, the, the nursery where they got them from was going to charge them like thousands of dollars to restock these trees. So now the trees are on my property. I have 25 eight and a half foot ficus trees and I'm watering them and they look great. I, I kind of don't want them to leave because I now I have a privacy barrier. The point was I was asking my friend about this. I said, why? Like why? And, and apparently the client was not too kind in their like refusal of this. They said, it's a hundred thousand dollar gig for us. If they want us to take back the ficus trees, we're going to take back the damn ficus trees. That's a mild version. I've heard a lot worse, more crazy stories of dealing with clients on big jobs. How do you energetically, emotionally, communicatively, is that a word? Communication wise? It is now. Communicatively deal with someone you perceive as difficult. How do you guys handle that? Yeah. So, Getting back to the process that unfolds for us at each section of our of our work together, we have what we call benchmarks. So we're getting benchmark approvals so that the eight and a half versus the nine foot ficus tree doesn't happen because we've we've theoretically hit every single benchmark. So if we get there, we would say, wait, how did this occur? How did this happen? Because in the previous stage, we were in approval. Everything was green lighted. So let's say we start with that design strategy day. From that, we create what we call a design playbook. And this playbook is amazing. It's every single thing that we've discussed together. And it's the guiding beacon for your, for creating your home from a design perspective, right? There's a, there's a sign off. There's an approval of that. So all of the baseline structure, the foundation has been approved. And then from there, we go on to the next stage and that stage is approved. And then from there, the next stage. And that stage is approved. And so if we were ever to get somewhere, we would simply default back to where did this happen? Where was the breakdown in the communication? Because everything successful in life is systematized from finding a, a recipe online to ordering coffee at Starbucks, right? Mm-hmm. If we, you know, I, I personally, I'm more of a tea person, don't drink the coffee. But um, if let's say I ordered, <laughs> right? No. So if, if I were to order, let's say an iced tea, And then I got to the end of the counter and the barista called my name and uh, I I grab what ends up being a hot chocolate or a hot mocha. I would be royally disappointed. Um, But that doesn't mean that Starbucks needs to go go back and kind of rework their entire process of taking an order and delivering a coffee coffee. They've got a system in place. It just means that we need to work backwards and look for the gap. Where was the breakdown in communication? And it's the same thing with working, you know, doing landscape architecture, building a home, designing and organizing your space. Everything that's successful in life is systematized. You know, for instance, um, the, the Starbucks and the coffee story, I, who knows, maybe I, I would have placed my order uh, using the app and I p- punched in the wrong button, or maybe I grabbed someone, someone else's drink on accident. So again, when when it goes through a, a process of creating a home, there are so many decisions, hundreds, if not thousands of decisions that are being made um, over a, sh- a relatively short window of time. And so communication is imperative that um, we're comfortable and we are asking questions and we come at it through, through the, the lens of being curious and wanting to know why. Why? 
nine foot trees. Mm-hmm. Why not eight foot? And so it, it, it's just, it's, it's mm-hmm. going back to Whitney, that the, the, the why understanding mm-hmm. and wanting to know more. Yeah. So, I mean, unfortunately we don't have any great stories <laughs> like that, but I, I would always be down for you to like text us a couple more. Cause those are great. <laughs> Those are super good. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's ultimately, I, I talked about the benchmarks. You could call them milestones, but that's really how we ensure that we don't get somewhere we shouldn't be. Right? And that's not to say, um, I would say probably um, the closest we can can uh, to come to answering your question, Jason, is a lot of times spouses, they'll fight and we'll find ourselves dead center of their confrontation. They are so comfortable with us that um, if something doesn't make sense or the other uh, opposes um, a a decision or a desire, um, they're not afraid to say, absolutely not, because it reminds me of this, that, or the other. Absolutely, you know, I don't want, so they're not afraid to to peel back the, the, their, their protective shell and be truthful and and let mm-hmm. their relation expose their relationship to us because that's how we're going to get mm-hmm. to a space yeah. that embodies both people, everybody in the family. Yeah, I think it also helps um, that Sherry and I play kind of devil's advocate <laughs> yeah. with one another, whether when we're in we're in you know whether we're doing it in back office and we're designing a space or whether we're in front of a client, we're we're constantly friendly, but challenging each other and why, and to think differently and to really push uh, our understanding uh, of that client's family and their space and their situation. And that I think creates that platform where, where a husband and wife feel comfortable or, um, you know, you know, an older couple feels comfortable talking about the next season of life Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what we're designing for in the future and what that looks like. We, we often talk about there's different seasons of life that we work with clients in, and they're always very different. Sometimes you're getting married and joining houses, right? Uh, merging households. Uh, sometimes you're bringing a new baby into the world or a dog. And then, you know, from there, you are maybe getting empty nests, sending k- kids off to school, right? And then from there, you're maybe downsizing. And so there's all these different seasons of life. Maybe you're getting a divorce. Um, there's all these different seasons of life that we kind of are working through. And so the process to ensure that we're always speaking the same love language, that we're always speaking the same jargon and make, and really pushing the ball forward is those benchmarks, those milestones. As you were describing sort of, uh, being in these situations with, you know, spouses having, uh, maybe heated conversations about what they're doing it 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 did make me flash on different HGTV shows where it's sort of you know manufactured drama where it's like I told you I wanted Periwinkle John this isn't Periwinkle you know it's like the, this this manufactured tension but you're talking about there are moments of actual tension and as you're saying that it brings up something um for me, that's interesting that I'm reflecting on in, in real time, which is, um, <laughs> I think a challenge for me in, um, thinking about cohabitating, uh, uh, with, with my girlfriend right now is, um, and this, this fear is completely unfounded because she's never told me that she wants to do this, but it's the idea that, that I really like my stuff. I like my couch. I like my bed. I like my side table. I like my lamp. You guys, I have this really cool vintage lamp here on the desk. You know, it's this idea that, you know, if I cohabitate with, with a partner, um, that they're going to somehow don't be like, I don't, well, I don't like that lamp and I don't like that couch. It's like, I'm not getting, I'm, I'm kind of stubborn. Whitney knows this. I'm, I'm, I'm an, I'm an open person, but I'm also stubborn in like, I like what I like. And so I think one one of my fears is is exactly what you're describing that I go into this next chapter of my life where um, the way that I can describe it is I feel a deeper desire to nest, like a really deep desire to nest. I'm going to be turning 44 this year. That that's arbitrary. It doesn't have anything to do with like you're 44, you need to nest. But I just I'm getting into my mid 40s and I feel a nesting vibe. But there's a fear in like, but I like my stuff and I ain't getting rid of my stuff. So it's, it's, it's a process of uncovering my own resistances or perhaps the barriers to change I've set up. Cause on the other side of that resistance, there might be something even better. There might be an even cooler couch and like a nice, you know, so I, I need to acknowledge my own stubbornness 
to change in this process. Yeah, and it's um, you're exactly correct, but you aren't wrong for having that fear or that apprehension because that's that's natural, right? Um, I, I think it's also it really resonates well with the misconception that uh, people have uh, when it comes to hiring an organizer or someone to come in and help you organize your stuff. Is that you're going to hire someone? They're just going to pack it all up in a garbage bag and make you get rid of everything. And that's when, at least when it comes to working with with our our team, it's the furthest from the truth. Because again, what I see and what I define as need and valuable is going to be completely different than how you view a need or what what I think is clutter. What you think is clutter is going to be completely different. Um, And so when it comes to our home, again, a broken record, it's understanding, Jason, where that's coming from. And again, you can start to see how when we work with clients for um, the old way of doing things, we would work with clients just room by room, how you miss over, you skim right over all of the good stuff, the time that it takes to truly dig in and understand where is that fear coming from. So it's not just about creating home, but it's a transformational journey that needs to be embraced by allowing yourself and stepping into a place of vulnerability and knowing that this is going to take me to a better place. I'm going to grow into a better person where I'm uh, uh, the best version of myself for my family, for my girlfriend, for my coworkers, all of the above. And so really, we work with clients to dig in and understand where is that fear coming from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where's, where's the fear, where's the fear coming from and, and feeling like she's going to make you get rid of something, Mm -hmm. right? Where's the fear of coming from in terms of your uh, unwillingness to, to even have that conversation. And I'm not saying you haven't, but I'm simply saying that we oftentimes we, we create uh, barriers to, to, uh, and limit ourselves. Right. And so we talk about um, often, you know, when we're working with a client and it's organizing or design, we're talking about internal, external or physical limitations. Right. Physical limitation would be like a space. Right. Um, An external limitation would be like um, they are um, struggling with time. Right. They just like they're really constrained with time. They're an executive. They don't have a ton of time. Uh, But an internal limitation would be like something like yourself, which you're grappling with is what do I, how do I handle this? What do I do? How do I approach this conversation? I'm scared to even start this conversation because I am already creating a barrier that I need to build up, right? That I need to, maybe she'll love the lamp. Maybe, maybe, (laughs) my point is simply that, that when you start to do this self-discovery, and, and, you know, in working with, with us, we're doing it with you. But when you start to do this self-discovery of, of really where that's coming from, now you're opening and, and creating a door for, for, for true growth in that relationship and in, with yourself. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating to think about our stuff and how much it's connected to our own um, self-worth, self-worth yeah. and growth and, and how we value ourselves. Um, yeah, and how we value our relationships. Yeah, this is all just part of the larger journey, really. I, I mean, it. It. I had no idea that our conversation today was going to take, you know, such such a, a deep introspective spiritual turn. But what you're saying makes a lot of sense because if if I look around at the physical objects in my space, um. Some of them have stories, you know, some of them I keep around because I've attached a meaning to uh, a phase in my life or a moment when I obtained this thing, or uh, uh, there's a sentimental value attached to it. And it's interesting because I I know that in the process of moving, whenever that's going to be, there's an opportunity to deeply take an emotional inventory not only of, of course, the relationship to the new space, but when you, you know, whenever I've moved and packed stuff up, that's another moment of, wow, what does this mean to me? Do I really want to take this thing into the new space? Does it really reflect who I am? Is there mean, or is it just I'm keeping it to have this thing because it's maybe an ego prop? And I, I think on one hand, I'm looking forward to that moving process and the beginning of that ne- next chapter. And I don't want to use the word dread, 
but I know that it's going to bring up a lot of emotions for me. And I'm probably going to be, you know, packing boxes and crying and being like, I put this thing. I just, God, and it's like, Jason, just let it go. It doesn't, you know, so it is a deep emotional, spiritual process of evolution of what you're describing. And, um, for me, you know, home being a place, as you said at the very beginning, I think you said refuge, John. I think that that's a very accurate description of like, I view my home as as a respite from the chaos of the outside world. I view it as a place to recharge. I view it as a place to, similar to what Whitney said at the beginning, I love having people over. You know, one of the things that I've expressed to her is a, a little bit of loneliness because I love it when people come over, you know, and hang out and we we make music or we we create, make a meal together. Um, so I, I guess, you know, kind of as we, as we, um, get closer to the end of this episode, I, I'm just, I'm leaving this conversation with you two, um, having a lot of not food for thought, but food for feeling. I feel like that's more accurate food for feeling. I, I, I feel like that's, I, that's the first time I think I've ever used that phrase in my life food for feeling, but it, but it legitimately is how I feel. And, um, you know, it's interesting that I'm looking at, you know, potentially the Pacific Northwest, because um, as an aside, uh, I did an astro cartography reading recently. Whitney and I did a whole episode on this where I had an astrologer map out the um, basically the power centers on the globe that were of the most advantageous to me, community, creativity, relationship, money, opportunity. And um, sure enough, Southern Oregon, Northern Washington were two of the power centers. So it could be that this is a very serendipitous episode with you two, because if I do end up in the Pacific Northwest, I was going to say you might be getting a knock on your door. Like, it's Jason, guys. I'm ready. Let's have some donuts and kick it. Let's do it. So it, it's just it's just been such an absolute pleasure, not only getting to see more of who you two are as individuals, because you've been so willing to, to show us part of who you are and your personalities, but sharing this deep introspective approach to what you do professionally to help people design the home of their dreams and interpret that for them. It's just so much more to it than I had ever imagined. So I'm just deeply gra- you know, grateful for you guys sharing what you do in your process, because I'm hoping that if everything lines up, that maybe I'll get to work with y'all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, we love that. And, um, we really just, we appreciated being on with you guys, having a great conversation. Um, there's nothing about really, there's nothing better in life than, than connecting with one another and having, having a meaningful interaction that you can then take and go build upon. I think you guys have made a huge impression on us as well. So, Well, for you, dear listener, if you're vibing as much as we are with John and Sherry's approach, you can check out their brand. Again, it's Elegant Simplicity, and we will link to their website in the show notes. Their website is elegantsi.com, and that's all on our website. The transcript for this entire episode, any of the resources we mentioned, their social media links, their website, their contact information is all at wellevator.com. That's W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. You can get in touch and work with them there and book a clarity call. If you are interested in hiring them and finding out how they can support you in creating and envisioning the home of your dreams. So we just, uh, we're so appreciative of you guys. Um, Definitely high vibes. And uh, like I said, I want to stay in touch because if I move up the coast, I'm feeling some synergy here. So thanks again for being on the show, guys. Thanks for getting uncomfortable with us. And uh, we will see you again, dear listener, dear watcher, uh, with another episode of This Might Get Uncomfortable Soon.